us. Got it. Well, thank you all uh, for making some time to do this. And let me introduce the two of you. Uh, Zion, this is Tom Gruber. Tom graduated from Strake Jesuit in 1977 and uh, then went on to have a, a long and very successful career in technology. Zion graduated in 2022 and uh, after a very successful career here, uh, especially in debate. And I know, Tom, you know, the last time that we talked or the in, in the summer, you mentioned uh, your experience of debate and being in the debate program here at Strike Jesuit and how helpful that was and meaningful that was. And so I thought, well, let's introduce uh, one of our most successful debate uh, competitors with someone who is you know, very successful and interested in debate. So that's kind of how this came about. And, you know, I guess, Tom, you said when we talked uh, how meaningful debate was, I guess maybe you could say a little bit more about that and how it, I don't know, how you think it helped you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, from the, from the beginning, you think about what, what you have to do to prepare for and to execute in debate, you have to be able to research a, a broad range of knowledge because these days, you know, competitive uh, techniques involve like trying to find corners that are not good. So basically cover the whole, be broadly educated in an area, going to the library, understanding things in depth, and then bringing to bear that information as evidence. So you have to have critical thinking skills, persuasive thinking skills that you have to be prepared for. And then, of course, in the actual moment of truth, like you're on, you're in a, in a, in a round, you need to think on your feet, analyze, understand, prioritize, respond, and so on. So that's exactly the same skills you need to do a lot of professional jobs. And so like, as me, I'm an entrepreneur. I've done a whole string of companies. One of them is Siri, and people know that one well. It has a lot of users. Uh, and the Siri, But every single time, it involves understanding a broad domain, understanding how a particular thing might, like for instance, you might think of a company, like a case in debate, like, okay, here's its point of view. I think we should do this thing. And if we did this thing, this good thing would happen. And you wanna make the argument for that. Well, that's what you do when you pitch for investors. You say to the investors, you know, who are generalists, they don't really know what, as much as you do about something. You say to them, hey, uh, I think you ought to do put your money here because it's going to pay off this way and it's going to have this impact on the world. That's so that skill is amazing. It's hard to see because when you see debate happening, I'd like to hear a lot all about design how it's how it happens today. Uh, it doesn't look like a business meeting or anything like that. But the cognitive skills involved are the same. And of all the things I've you know learned from high school uh, at Strake Jesuit, there was a bunch you know that were important math and so on. But that ability to understand, analyze, bring evidence to bear, and persuade has been really useful my entire life. That's great. You know, you asked Tom this summer you, that you were curious to know how debate has has or has not changed from when you were involved in it. And so, yeah, I don't know how we get into that, but uh, Zion, you know, uh, what, what's what been your experience of debate here and, you know, what would be a typical, you know, how do you prepare? I don't know, Tom, you might have a better idea of how to answer that question or ask that question. Well, I, asked, I mean, I, I don't know how to ask, answer the question, but I mean, when I was a senior and like at the top of my game in debate, I had, what, eight trays of four by six cards, <laughs> or whatever they were through yeah i mean <laughs> trays of cards in 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 these sort of salesman cases um that we carried around i mean it was a mini library of course prepared in briefing books and so on kind of like lawyers in a sense but it was it was something that was just waiting for the computer age which hadn't quite arrived yet so i'm sure that you know in your world i don't know if they i assume they let you bring a computer into the debate room i'm not sure uh, but it seems like you would now we're talking about very sophisticated indexing retrieval and much larger libraries um, of, of, of content to draw from when you're when you're putting together uh, an argument. Is, is that right? That is right. Yeah. And I think like I've almost experienced three different eras of debate with like pre-COVID, during COVID and after COVID. And so it's been interesting to see mm -hmm. how technology has had even a bigger effect during like 
quarantine because there is an area, uh, an era of debate for like two years where everything is fully online. And so what that did is it brought a lot more new different people to tournaments, but it also like made this element of like hybrid debate an idea. And I think like a lot of the discourse between the debate like members that happened was a lot more frequent and happening over like online service and things like that. And so now when we get back into like, I think pretty, like I think now the debate's pretty much as in person as it has been before. I see a lot of effects of COVID. Like I think that it's kind of affect like beyond the competition of socialization of members in the community and that it's not as social anymore and the competitive like competition part about it I don't know how to explain it it's just kind of different and I honestly think it's a little bit less nuanced and robust than it was beforehand um I don't really know why that is the case but I've noticed like within the last year or two that debates tend to be a little bit more shallow than they were beforehand I think people have become like very reliant in technology in terms of like how they make and store their argumentation so people have less accustomed to like thinking on their feet and thinking just like just paper and pen. Um, so that's something that I've definitely seen within like over the years as well. And it's really interesting. I'm trying to imagine how like, I can imagine there's a lot of clicking on Zoom as people are putting together their argument. Um, but yeah, that's really intriguing because there is something about paper and pen. We we use just for those people who are um, maybe more than 40 or whatever in the audience. I mean, like we used to do it with what lawyers use legal they call it legal pad because that's what lawyers use long paper long pads of paper about 30 percent longer than normal paper and for some reason lawyers love that stuff and then we would like we would make it arguments we draw we write them out horizontally in this flow pad they call it right and then they would have these little pieces of paper with these index or these evidence because when you cite evidence you have to be precise like okay somebody from nature journal Somebody from New York Times said this thing at this point in time. You want to have that ready as a fact. So, but the most important thing was that this writing was really important and that that you did this in real time. I'm sure you can type now in real time, um, but still, but that meant that also there was a timing was part of the game. Mm -hmm. That that people would, um, there, there would be like a strategy that, some people could think fast and type that or write fast and respond fast. Other people would be more kind of slow, but articulate and or maybe more persuasive in kind of a storytelling way that might that doesn't require so many facts and everything. So that's that's interesting. But that that timing was part of it. If you could just if everything could be like, boom, boom, boom. OK, I got an argument for that. I got an argument for that. Click, 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 click. Just weave it together. Um, I'm not sure what it feels like. I haven't seen a debate in many, many years. I can imagine that that could change. And so I'm not a Luddite. I like technology. I, I hate, I can't read my own writing on a piece of paper. So I'd, I'd be happy to see that flow pad replaced with something else. But I, I hear what you're saying, Zion, that maybe because of the timing now, um, it becomes more mechanical, like more reflexive, like superficial. Yeah. It's like, wow, how am I going to get this point across? I only have like, you know, three minutes to do it. What am I going to say? Yeah. You know, Zion, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, like, we definitely still have, like, flow pads, um, but it's a lot more digital. I'm one of the few who still use paper, actually. I strongly advocate for it. Um, I think it allows a little bit more flexibility in, like, thinking, and you can visualize that on paper than, like, doing it on computer can do and organizational things. But it's a lot moving to, like, online flow pads and then, like, cards there's just because they're online now and you don't have to like bring them in physically there's just like an ab infinite abundance amount and so that does change like the way that you prepare for evidence and the way that you respond to evidence because there's just like especially in college because i'm like debating in college and the rounds are two hours now and it's just like a bunch of cards that i you really have to like be able to prepare for but also it's a different kind of preparation um and then, yeah, it's it's pretty very fast paced as well. So I think that, like you said, it's become a little bit more mechanical. Um, and I I definitely I'm seeing like downsides to it, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if there's much I can do because it's like a new generation of people coming in that have not seen debate in a way that I saw it before COVID, which is also kind of wild. 
a really interesting insight before COVID, because before COVID, you were physically in a room, right, with the judges, with the other mm -hmm. opponents, your colleague. You could whisper to your colleague, and says, "Yeah, that's really interesting. It could be a different change." Let me ask you this, Ian. Like the um, the other thing about that when you were kind of in this room and you stood up, it's like time to stand up and make a talk, make a speech, right? There's something, there's something real um, present about, it. there's something, I don't know how to say it, but there, there's a kind of a, a moment there that's emotional and you feel it, you feel the room, you feel the, the spirit of the thing. I don't know what happens when you're online with that. Uh, is that something that changed after COVID and, and now a more digitized version of this? No, yeah, that's a very real question. Um... Because you're right, there is something very profound in that, and you learn to be able to captivate a room in that from the second you stand up to the end of your speech. And especially as I got more successful, like my rooms would be pretty, pretty packed with spectators. And so then that changed to where like the people weren't going anywhere, but it was just like a bunch of Zoom screens and like it wasn't even mm -hmm. like cameras, just like Zoom names. And so it just it doesn't I don't know, it changed my ability to connect with those in the room. And almost sometimes it feels like I was speaking to myself. Interesting. Well, I just recently got invited to give a talk at, to get do a debate at the Harvard Union. Uh, really? I'm just talking, the Cambridge Union, not the Harvard Union, the Cambridge Union, the one in England. Awesome. Awesome. The Oxford or Cambridge. I'm. A, I mean, it's really offensive for those people who go to Oxford or Cambridge to confuse the two because they're like rivals. <laughs> but <laughs> Oxford Union, sorry, probably Oxford <laughs> Union. Anyway, the one that they claim to be the famous debate. So. Um, <laughs> But there's a case where you actually, they put them in like, you know, white tie and suits and everything. And you're in this ancient room with the wood on the walls and then everyone, and then in sort of British parliamentary style, you have all these guys like, ah, from the audience, like shouting stuff at you and stuff during the thing. Um, but there's, that's a theater you couldn't recreate in Zoom. It's just so, it's so cool. Unfortunately, timing wise, I couldn't, I couldn't make it at the time, but you know, maybe we'll figure out a way. Um, but I can see that's but it's but it's also kind of almost a Monty Python sketch of what a debate could be because you know the they have members of parliament there stand up and give um give talks and then they're just like slandering their opponents in like and, and just these horrible like just over the top like <laughs> stuff that's just almost it's it's just speaking to a comedy audience almost. Um but it is still debate, which is funny. It's it's the it's the it's the taking the old robes and putting them on the new on the new people. Um yeah, it's pretty cool. Let me ask you about something else. Since you're like what, twenty six or something? How old are you right now? You're in college. <laughs> 19, right? I'm nineteen. You're nineteen. Oh, so you just got into college. Okay, yeah. you're just in your debate career. Okay, so um, so obviously you're born digital. So we have a world now where folks used to read books and, and I mean actual from the cover to cover. We used to um, not that that's not possible with ebooks, but also. We used to um, like think articles were kind of like the unit of of content, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's getting shorter and shorter. And now, of course, we have a, a 140 character like tweet um, or an X. You, you see, X doesn't work. As a noun. <laughs> it's just it's totally different. Now. Um, but also like what is it to mean with and, and of course, YouTube Instead of reading, you listen, or but you actually you actually don't listen. You watch a performance, um, and so now debate is kind of, you know, based on the idea that well, language has power and language means something, and also that evidence has power. That there's a there's a notion that you don't just say it persuasively, like, hey, yeah, those bad guys are all you know, blah blah blah, and then like that's persuasive. It's just not good. It's not good discourse. Um, right. But if you could you say, well, by the way, you know, climate change is kind of a big deal because of these reasons. And this is why you should do these things. That's an argument. Right. But the attention span afforded by the media today doesn't really allow for long form talks in a really in a way, long term argument. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? Has that has that changed in your experience as a young person? Do you see that? Yes, like I I think that well I I think that my experience of like argumentation and discourse is very different than a lot of my peers and I I honestly notice that more so in the classrooms than anything else because mm -hmm. the ways in which sometimes that I will engage in like discussions or literature that we're going over um like you said in terms of like attention span it's just like it feels a lot 
more robust almost than my peers and it's not even like what they're saying is not quality it's just I feel like we have been trained to think so quickly and abruptly and also I think that there's a tendency to kind of just follow information rather than mm-hmm. like seek information from all different sides I think that's something that debate teaches you to do when you hear something you're like hmm let me hear what else is being said about this whereas now you see like a a post or something and you kind of take that information and it people internalize that as what it is so i've also seen that as well well i double and triple down on that one i mean that's a big skill um people used to say oh debaters like lawyers or whatever but actually there's a point in which we the good way in which debaters are like lawyers which is lawyers are hired to make a point of view to take a point of view and execute on it right and so um now lawyers are positioned as mercantile, like they'll take whatever point of view they get paid to have. But even in debate, we could argue, we're saying, okay, flip a coin, positive, negative. What side are you taking here? Um, give, and it's not even just even side, just like given the affirmative, what are your possible responses on the negative? So these are things that we have a choice to, we can say things with conviction and believe in them and give our best at making the case even for opposing points of view, right? right. That's really the uh, reason most of my colleagues in debate went on to be lawyers. I became kind of more of a scientist, but I use the same skills in science. It's, it's thinking about, because in science is the ultimate kind of intellectual debate. It just happens at a different pace and a different way than like legal debate. But it's the, still the same thing. Like, I don't know. I think cold fusion is possible. Really? I don't think so. Why don't you think so? Because I'm an old fart. Well, that's not a good answer. Give me some more evidence. Yeah. Well, how about evidence for this? Okay, blah, blah, blah. And they go back and forth and they really kind of settle out these controversial things, right? right. And so that's, that's a, you know, some people call that the spiral of the dialectic, right? Where it gets, you actually, by arguing, arguing things from different points of view with sincerity, with integrity, you actually get closer to a real truth or a real, a real insight, right? And that I think if we can lead, I mean, folks like you ought to be the, you know, can lead the new generation of like, hey guys, it's not a matter of what's trending is true. Trending isn't true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's another way of thinking about this. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. A few moments ago, we got, you know, we're, y'all were talking about, you know, uh, technology and uh, almost kind of, you know, expressing the limits of technology and maybe how it has been limiting. But, uh, you know, Tom, you were obviously deeply involved in technology for a lot of your career and, you know, and helping found Siri and invent that and before that other things. But um, I guess AI is a topic that's on everybody's mind and uh, especially in education. Uh, Zion, how is it? Is it a topic at Harvard, you know, AI among students, teachers, what's happening in the conversation right now? Yeah, it definitely is. So I'm um, an editorial writer for the Harvard Crimson, which is like our newspaper journalism here. And one of the things we've been talking about is like AI and how the schools responded to it. And I've been pretty interested to see Harvard's response. And it's it's more of a like, especially concerning chat GBT, it's less of a like, this is not allowed, but more so like, Let's think about ways that we can utilize this to better enhance the ways that we think and engage in our classes. And so in using it in a way that's not like cheating or uh, in a dishonest way of like assessment, but more so in a way that like creates more rigorous dialogue and thinking. And I that that's really interesting to me because before that I hadn't really like I knew that there's kind of that possibility, but I think that I was pretty hesitant that that could actually be like how people engage in it but that seems to be kind of the route that most of the teachers here are taking i think that well, be, but that? Also, they, it's a good goal but how are they achieving that of how is the user right that's what i was going to say because there's i think there's a struggle in almost monitoring or ensuring that ai is used in the ways in which you want to use so that almost forces them to have more of an open-ended like goal with it because i think that if anything that's a little bit more restrictive i don't i'm unsure in their ability to monitor it um but it's all like very new especially in terms of chat gpt i think that teachers and like administrators are still trying to figure out like what this means how do we use it should we use it and things like that um and so it's very interesting to see how like 
teachers and administrators are talking about it, but also students, because I think that the goals in mind with students here and administrators here are not the same in terms of AI. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I was just trying to put it in context with you guys. Uh, you know, Father Jeff, like, okay, you, most of the folks that graduate from your institution are fairly good at writing a sentence, you know, putting together a paper even. Um, we have a crisis in education where a lot of people get out of high school and can't, right? And um, and so they might get into college and go, well, I mean, I could write this pretty bad essay or I can get this thing to help me write it, right? And, uh, and the question is really, well, okay, one question is, are they still learning when they have the thing help them? And they, they're learning something, I think. I, I don't know if they're learning what, it's not shoring them up. They might also be taking the class from the GPT that teaches them how to write. That's all. That's be, that would be cool. Um, but then we up it to like your game, like at Harvard or straight Jesuit graduates, where pre people are fairly good at writing. So it's not like it doesn't have to shore them up at like basic language skills, which was what really what today's generation is pretty good at. You give it, give it kind of not so good writing. It'll do a decent job of cleaning up, or you give it an article to read, it'll do an okay job of making a summary of it. Um, now, what does that mean for education? Well, one thing is it might be for the folks that don't really have to need, don't need help with that skill, it might be, well, now we can scale. I was just, I was just literally an hour ago talking to a, a bunch of entrepreneurs or who, who want are building a thing so that you can read instead of reading whatever how many papers a week you read. Um, it can create this environment where the AI is reading all of the papers and all of your peers are getting all of the summaries that they need at scale and commenting. So they're operating at this sort of like hyper speed review process of the entire scientific literature. So that now, because right now, I mean, the status quo would be like, I'm reading the paper. It's really boring, but I'm gonna get myself through it because I'm a professional in this field. And then maybe if I have an extra time, I might write a little summary in my favorite social media thing or my, to my, in my notes or something. But it doesn't scale, right? But if you had all of the published literature of science constantly being digested by AI and then constantly being fed to people who on, with an intelligent interest, interest profile, and and now this the fact that we might have this summary level uh, intro to a broad swath of content then it's oh there's a paper I really want to read the original end okay boom right I go go down there and plow in there and read the whole thing right there's something possible here it's it's interesting we're we're just just beginning to see what this could do but it yeah. does that particular use case requires an a literate and and kind of a truth seeking intelligent human. To, do, to use it. If we're in a world where we're all just following the propaganda that's put in front of us, it's not gonna work. That's right. Well, I, I might I might have misquoted you, but I, I remember from our conversation this summer, I think you said something like chat GPT knows a lot, but it doesn't know the truth. And that's true. It, and it takes, you know, you know, the human interaction. And what I've enjoyed about just the last couple of minutes is, you know, it's not, we got to get past the, is chat GPT good or bad? And, you know, okay, well, what are the opportunities here for, you know, I don't know. It sounds almost like there's a, a chance to democratize education a little bit. And that, you know, if someone doesn't have access to good teaching and good education, maybe chat GPT can help them learn how to write a sentence, like you said. And, uh, and you could think of other ways that chat GPT could help people. Um, it reminds me of our conversation earlier this summer about, you know, why did you, why were you interested in, you know, creating something like Siri and and maybe the things that came before it? Yeah, I, I, in fact, that's a really good good question because, uh, and for for folks that are earlier in their careers, um, I have found it convenient to have kind of a philosophy, a career philosophy that I followed, and I I came upon it kind of early, I said, you know, in my thirties. That was, it wasn't obvious from the beginning, but the, the philosophy was, I'm going to be good at AI. I know that. I'm in the middle of this field. I love AI. I think it has a great future. But there are sort of two ways you can think of this. You could think of it as 
great way to make money, automate stuff, blah, blah, blah. Or you can think of it as a way of making humans smarter. And I chose that path. So that's actually every single choice uh, project I do is in that realm or in that, in that, in that philosophy. Um, and that really helped a lot. And so you'll see there's actually huge, it's not just me, there's huge camps of people in, uh, that, that, that take those two points of view. So if you're looking at, if you're like um, Saul, Saul Khan, who does the Khan Academy, right? He's an, he's an educational guy. He wants to use technology for education. He sees chat B GPT and goes, he embraces it. He immediately goes to the open AI guys and says, give me some of that. I want to work with that stuff and make it help me make, make my mission, which is to teach the entire, you know, billions of people, the basics of stuff. Um, but we're, we're seeing whole strata of, of knowledge workers now. The, the Harvard graduates are going to be like, well, we're not going to have the same job we thought we were going to have when we started college. <laughs> our, mm -hmm. our new jobs, we're not going to, not, none of us are going to be writing like really boring legal briefs or really boring marketing copy or whatever we're going to do or memos to other executives trying to, no, we're going to be like working with essentially an army of automated assistants working for, for us you know, doing what we, at a more strategic level. So we're almost going to be all like little vice presidents of our own careers. Um, and that'll be a new skill that we'll, we'll have to learn how to do. Um, and and, the, and there'll be, there will be a need for fewer people uh, that do those skills by hand. That's, that's mm -hmm. really a bummer for those folks trapped in those careers. If you're, if you're stuck on a career and you only have one educational background, that's going to be a real struggle to get out of that into something else yeah zion what what do you want to do when uh after you graduate from college any ideas yet like not i don't know i've wanted to be like go into like academia and be a professor and read and write i've considered the possibility of law school um Lately, I've also been considering something more interpersonal, like um, I don't really know what it would look like, but almost like a group counselor role as something that I would consider as well. I don't really know, but all of those things are things that I've thought about. Do you think the chat, the language model models today will change the nature? Let's say, let's say you were thinking about going to law school and become a lawyer. You think that career is going to be completely different by the time you graduate? I think so, because the way that you like consume information and produce information and just any ways in which you interact with it is drastically different already, but it's continuing to be drastically different. So I think that it's almost hard to even conceptualize like what certain things will look like as things continue to progress. Yeah, it's hard to have a future proof plan for your career today if you're a young person. It's tricky. Um, although I will argue for the skills that you have as a, as a champion debater, uh, thinking on your feet, assessing information quickly, seeing the big picture, being able to see multiple perspectives on an issue, those continue to be really valuable. You know, and if you think about like the places where this automation might come in, for instance, I'm a skilled like software engineer, right? I mean, uh, and I don't really program that much anymore, but I manage people who do and I, you know, whatever, but I know how to do it. I was great at one point. So, that job is completely going to be different in a few years. So really the skill now will be like, so, but, but here's the difference. If you, as, as I, in my career, I was able to afford to buy, you know, hire programmers rather than do the programming myself. Um, and I had to learn, how do you tell another intelligent agent to create a program that does a thing you want? That's a different skill than doing it directly. When you do mm -hmm. it directly, and a lot of people have that thrill of having been the producer and the, and, the, and the director and everything all together. Like, oh, I made a video game and I did it all. I conceived of it and I implemented it and it's really cool. But as, as these, get, these projects get bigger, you see some people think of the idea and think of and the vision of what it could be. And then they hire lots and lots of people to do bits of it until you end up with lots of programmers or lots of, say, creative people. And now we have a world where uh, a lot of that lower level stuff is going to be automated. And it's true in law, by the way, as well, too. Right. Right. Um, and so I think we might want to. So one way of thinking about the sort of meta strategy for what, how do you think about your future? And you're smart to not pick one now because you're 
19. Uh, but I mean, because the society says you should know by now, especially if you're at Harvard, right? But it does, that, it does, yes. But there's no way you can. How can you possibly know what you're going to do? Um, yeah, but you know, when I was 19 in college, I was a psych major and I had, I did, a, I loved it. I'm good at psychology. I just got my degree in psychology, but I added computer science like a year later when the computer arrived. Mm. There was no computer at my college and then there was one. And immediately I became also, we created a computer major and I became a double major in computers. And so it might be like, there might be a thing like halfway, you know, your sophomore year is like, I don't know. AI administrator. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. You know, yeah. how do you manage, you know, an enormous resource of knowledge creation and, and knowledge workers that are synthetic? Seems like, you know, no matter what what you choose to do, Zion, you know, and then what you gotta have some guiding principle. And uh, you know, Tom, you said you had your philosophy, uh, you know, which way you want to go in this and uh, Tom, I don't think that the, I don't know how much the phrase was used on campus here uh, in the 70s, but, you know, forming men for others is what we do. Hmm. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, if that's your guiding philosophy, that you've got these critical thinking skills and you're remaining nimble, uh, not deciding on anything yet, but your guiding principle is I'm going to be a man for others there's a whole lot of things you can do. Um, a lot of things are still open to you. You haven't narrowed yourself to one thing. Um, just having to, just plugging our mission a little bit. No, I, I think that's a really good mission. And by the way, it gets more relevant the older you get too. It turns out, I mean, I mean, the, the thing about it is if we look at, and, and folks in your generation, I know uh, you guys have a kind of an angst for good reason. Like the world is a mess and it's getting worse and systems uh, are breaking down. Even the notion of liberal democratic governance might be gone by the time you get out of college. I mean, it's crazy how fast things are moving. So your some, but some people's response is, ah, whatever, I can't do anything. But actually, figuring out that you know you can. I mean, there's the only way it's going to get fixed is that people step up and do something for the society, like be there for to fix the system, not just to get the boat in the backyard and everything but actually fix the system so that well eight billion people will be better off and it's a pretty good north star because you can still do individual things towards that mm -hmm. right as long as the guiding principle is there like do it for others i like that sound like a deal zion <laughs> yeah <laughs> it does great well i'm like, gonna pull this out of the vault you know in four years Jeff, yeah, 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 yeah. Really yeah. Before and after. Well, I've kept <laughs> it a little longer than than I said I would, but I, I'm. I I think this is a really neat. Um, I don't know. Hopefully, we can make something uh, out of this that for the future. Putting earlier generations of uh, straight Jesuit grads with more recent grads, and just having a conversation like this, and um, and I thought the debate connection was a natural uh, starting point for this. And I really am grateful to both of you. I know you're very busy and uh, you probably have some classes to go to Zion and um, hopefully no test today. Um, yes. Thank you all very much. And uh, I think you all have each other's contact and information and, you know, it, it'd be cool if y'all stayed in touch, but I will leave that to you. Yeah, let's do that Zion. Stay in touch. I mean, I mean I've never yeah. actually met a straight judgment guy who went on to nationals and Lindsay. that's great. Congratulations. Good <laughs> thing. I got I got fairly close and I was like thankful I didn't actually get, get because of the workload that it, it took yeah. flies in the committee. So really what you did, yeah, uh, congratulations. I'm I'm impressed and proud of you. So yeah, let's stay in touch. And um and I, I, Father Jeff, I appreciate what you put to, putting us together. This is really cool, really cool experience. Yeah. Thank you. This has been great. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank y'all. Take care. Thank you. All right. Good Ciao.